Hi again there, mythologists. Continuing on our lecture series to talk about the causes of conflict behind the Trojan War. Uh, remember, this is now part two of our lecture that would have been today, January 22nd. Uh, we began with Homer and the Homeric problem, talked about some of the key figures in that debate from Milman Perry to Friedrich August Wolf, uh, and talked about the differences between Hesiod and Homer. Uh, also now talking about causes of conflict, uh, had also addressed the logistics um, of the upcoming assignments. Do check back to that video if you're worried about when things are coming due. Uh, in short, almost everything that's coming up now will be due on Friday, February 2nd. But let's go to our causes of conflict and talk about what was the source of the Trojan War? What caused it? So let me pose that question to you for a second just to think about what was it exactly that caused the Trojan War? So we, we have two sources that we can look to. Uh, Lombardo's uh, translation of the Iliad, uh, which is the epic most closely associated with the Trojan War, but we also had all those readings from the anthology that addressed some of these issues. Um, so what does the Iliad tell us that caused the Trojan War? Well, the Iliad's frustratingly somewhat silent about this because the Iliad begins, as Horace, the Roman poet, would say, in medius race, in the middle of things. As we open up, um, the priest of Apollo from near Troy, Chryses, comes down to Agamemnon, the kind of... Uh, grand commander, commander-in-chief of the assembled Greek army, uh, and they've been sacking the towns up and down the Trojan co coastline, and had taken this man, this prophet, Chryses' daughter, Chryseis. Uh, they do this a lot where a man is named Chryses, and his daughter is named Chryseis. It's just a kind of feminine version of the name. Um, but we can we can go for that. So it's a little bit confusing. But Chryses is the father. Chryseis is the girl. Uh, so Chryses demands his daughter back, and Agamemnon says, "Tough. I'm the king. What you're going to do? Go cry about it to somebody else." So then, of course, Chryses does go and cry about it to somebody else. That someone else, namely being Apollo, uh, who has the power uh, to you know send plagues. That's why I'm sick and can't be in class today. Um, these sorts of things. So that's good. That gets us going with the conflict within the story itself. But that doesn't talk about the Trojan War at all. So what was it that caused the Trojan War? Big picture. Well, I think there are two kind of topic headings that we might put good causes under, one being injustice. And we might think that, well, Helen, the wife of Menelaus, the most beautiful woman in Greece, was stolen from her husband by, Menel uh, by sorry, not by her husband Menelaus, by Paris, the prince of Troy, one of the princes of Troy. He's the younger uh, brother of Hector uh, and son of Priam, the king. So this injustice is the sort of thing that really creates the... Um, um, war and that uh, Menelaus has to go back and, and fight for Helen, but why would you fight for somebody? Why would you, you know, I, I think there are good reasons of, you know, saving face and other things why you might start a war, but really it's, it's one person, uh, it's one woman, uh, it's, it's not, you know, people later in antiquity would say that's a stupid reason to fight 10 years and have hundreds and thousands of people die. Um, better, better just to, you know, say, oh, you got me that time or maybe do something else, not have a full war about it. So, so is the injustice the full story? And I think beauty is another good candidate here. And I'll, I'll go into some of the reasons why. Um, but let's, let's uh, look at a picture first and, and get some images going on. What, what's, what's this? And this is taken from the website that has a lot of useful information. It's normally pretty good, uh, if not that analytical, www.theoi, also known as gods.com. And this is a picture on an attic uh, red figure, so that's going to be 5th century, 400s, uh, drinking vessel. Uh, you can see a handle here. So we've got a number of figures. We have a seated figure here with a um, a liar. We have a walking figure here with a hat, uh, staff, and uh, kind of feather boots. Uh, and then we have three women. Uh, you, you could tell this is a young man because he doesn't have a beard. Uh, this is an older gentleman. And then we have these women. I'll just tell you they're women. And then there are certain ways that you can see what's going on. So this woman has a kind of snaky thing. This is her agus. Uh, we, we talk about an agus as a shield, but in a way it's this kind of shield shawl that she wears. We can't see the top of the image, but she's got a crested helmet. This is Athena. 
This woman is fairly nondescript, a uh, nice uh, rich robe, a staff, staff indicating power. This is Hera, wife of Zeus, so daughter of Zeus and Matus in a way. Um, Hera, wife of Zeus. And then we have a woman here with a kind of modest shawl around and is surrounded by these little winged figures. Well, who are those? Well, those are early Cupids. Cupid, of course, is the Latin name uh, for the Greek god Eros. Uh, both mean desire. So these are the kind of little desirable things. This is indicating that this is Aphrodite. So we have Aphrodite, Hera, Athena, and then who do you think this is with a kind of staff? This is a traveler's cap, and then these winged boots are there to kind of help him be a messenger. This is Hermes, messenger of the gods. And then here we have Paris. What is this? This is the what's famously called the Judgment of Paris, where we have a beauty competition between the three goddesses, um, well, three of the many Olympians, but, but three of the heavier hitters, Aphrodite, Athena, and Hera. Um, of course, there was this... We can keep the story going back and say, well, there was a golden apple that was inscribed to the fairest, uh, and they wanted to win that prize. That was kind of the, the goal of this beauty contest. Uh, they go to Zeus and say, hey, can, can you moderate this prize? And Zeus is wise and says, no, no, no. I'm not uh, making two of you a loser and one of you a winner. Uh, go find some mortals. So they go and find uh, Pri uh, not sorry, Paris here uh, sitting on Mount Ida, and you can tell he's going to kind of goat herd shepherd because he's got these animals around him here, these goats. Um, it, it's a bit funny for us to think of a prince of a you know large state or city being a goat herd, but this is part of the kind of myth that's attached to uh, Paris here. Uh, a very, um, what they call bucolic or um, idyllic myth where, where he's a man of nature and out there. He's also famously handsome. You won't necessarily tell it from this picture. Uh, but part of the what we're seeing here is there's a competition of beauty among these goddesses. Goddesses already being kind of thought by the Greeks to be far beautiful to any mortal. Uh, so mortals can only get so beautiful, then the gods and goddesses are above that. Goddesses and gods were also thought to be a little larger than mortals and heavier, uh, but otherwise, you know, pretty anthropomorphic, as you can see here. They're you know, they're human-like here with the addition of these kind of angel wings for Cupid. So we have here Paris sitting, now being approached to Hermes and being given the, the chance. So these goddesses also aren't going to let this be a fair competition. They're all going to add a, a, an element of bribery to it. Uh, Athena is going to grant some wisdom. Hera is going to grant power. They're kind of giving the things that they are associated with. That's what they could bestow on Paris. Uh, so he's getting a little bit of a benefit out of being the, the judge in this competition. Um, finally, we have Aphrodite here who promises Paris the most beautiful woman in the world. And Paris, being a young and handsome man himself, clearly chooses Aphrodite. So you can see here we have a overlapping of beauty. We have a beauty contest. Let me zoom ahead to a future slide. We've got a beauty contest that's sparked by this golden apple. And we have a beautiful judge, Paris. Um, and he picks Aphrodite, and she's a goddess who's associated uh, with beauty the most, and she promises Helen, the world's most beautiful woman, as a prize. The, the, the levels of beauty just kind of keep reverberating in this scenario. So beauty, in, in a way, might be the cause. So here's an ancient you know, depiction, but of course, this talk of beauty and the scene uh, could be a favorite among artists of almost any generation. Here we have Peter Paul Rubens is, you know, version, and, and we can see a lot of the same elements at play. We don't have, um, because uh, Rubens wanted to do a kind of fully nude, or at least uh, slightly modest image, uh, we, we kind of get the hints elsewhere. So we can see uh, the animals out to pasture in the background. We can see Athena has kind of taken off her rope. There's the Aegis on the shield, as we're more used to seeing. Uh, we've got Hera here wearing her crown because she is the queen, uh, and looking slightly older than these two, which I think is appropriate. Uh, also kind of some rich... Um, uh, works right there. Then we see the two cupids. We can see Cupid here with his arrow quiver, um, and then Aphrodite in the center, clearly the object of uh, Paris's gaze here. Uh, you can also see, I'm not sure if they do much with the wings here, uh, but we have the winged traveler's cap, and then here's the, the golden apple, the, the, the prize of it all. So beauty seems to be part of the cause here, uh, but what 
we could say, well, why is there this beauty contest? Where did this apple come from? Why, why is this the beginning? And what I want to talk about is this idea of grafting of myth. And what's grafting? Well, if we know uh, botany and things, if you have a tree and you cut off a branch and you can apply another branch to it, that branch might grow and kind of have its own attributes. With myth, you can always add something more. None of these myths are so tightly wrapped up that they can't have, that they don't have some loose thread that could be uh, turned into spun into a myth of its own. Uh, we were finding this as we were writing our own myths in class that sometimes what your myth might need to do is kind of give a little more information about a myth that's already out there. Keep working through it. So. Uh, we know the Iliad and the Odyssey because people are familiar with these, but these were just two epics in this giant epic cycle. Uh, a group of long poems, none of them probably half as long as the Iliad and Odyssey, which really are remarkable on a number of ways, uh, but they filled out the story of the Trojan War. A little bit of a spoiler alert for the Iliad, um, it ends before the war is over. Uh, we don't see the Trojan horse, uh, we don't see the things that caused the war, we just see this you know, kind of snapshot of two weeks during the ninth week or the ninth year of the war. Uh, I guess it's more like a month in total, but really just a short period of time in the whole experience of the Trojan War. This is a very narrow focus. The epic cycle fills some of these things out. And then one of these stories of the epic cycle, uh, known as the Cypria or Cypria, um, it explains that the goddess Earth, Gaia, um, prays to Zeus to relieve herself of the burden of mankind. Uh, mankind has been too heavy, uh, they're, you know, they're becoming a problem for her, and Zeus says, okay, I'm going to start a war, and to start this war, I'm going to create this beauty contest, which is then going to lead to the abduction and the injustice of Helen, uh, which will bring us back to the Trojan War, what ultimately caused it. So we say, okay, <laughs> so we have a Trojan War that's, you know, mythically happened. Uh, we need to come up with an explanation for that. Stealing a woman seems like a, a, a logical place to begin. Uh, but then, of course, we need to s explain why um, that woman needed to be steal or stolen. And then we say, well, okay, we've got the judgment of Paris. Uh, she was the reward. Um, and this beauty theme between Paris, Helen, and Aphrodite kind of reverberates. But then why have this beauty contest at all? Uh, well, we could talk about um, a kind of ecological issue of uh, overpopulation and the earth needs a solution. Um, you could see that there's no easy answer to what caused the Trojan War. I think the abduction of Helen by Paris would be the kind of clear answer, um, but, but to kind of think about, well, what was the broader context, what caused everything, um, it, it goes far, it goes very far back, and if you are a mytho-poet right here and you want to be creating something, you could make a myth of why the earth was overburdened. Uh, and well, the, you know, in a way, that would be the prime cause for the Trojan War. These things can keep going back, and this is a beauty of myth, a, a myth that, like a cotton ball, can be kind of added to and then regrouped as you go on. Uh, and for any story, any good story, like um, the, you know, heroic epics that are starting in the middle of things, you just take a small snapshot of the broader context uh, and leave it to your audience members to know the bigger myth, the, the kind of mega myth behind everything. You're interested in telling a story with people. Any of these you know, stories of the Judgment of Paris are good to focus in on uh, because telling the giant myth, as I've just done in the past 14 minutes, can be a bit boring and a little bit circular. Um, but these are all part of the bigger myth, and that's what we want to see. So in the next section, we'll talk about uh, the conflict between Achilles and Agamemnon in particular, and talk about what's making these people unhappy in the war. Why, nine years later, are these things just now beginning to bubble up? See you then.